movement transesophageal echocardiogram basics part three this concerns moderate sedation this is a series that I've developed for cardiology fellows looking for more experience and guidance regarding transesophageal echoes so in terms of moderate sedation the first question that I ask is the candidate is the patient a candidate for moderate sedation so Often patients who are younger than 40 years of age are very difficult to sedate. Um, obviously, patients who take chronic pain medications such as OxyContin or Vicodin or Xanax, uh, you're not going to be able to get much bang for your buck regarding Versed and fentanyl. Former alcoholics, even several years out, are often difficult to sedate. Active IVDU, but past substance abuse as well. And uh, other issues regarding whether or not you're going to be able to manage the airway are extremely important, such as if the patient has obstructive sleep apnea, uh, BMI greater than 40, or maybe uh, they're already wearing oxygen secondary to emphysema. So for these patients, I have a very low threshold for using anesthesia and propofol and having someone else uh, manage the airway who has experience with intubation. For all the rest of the patients, as long as they don't have any significant issues uh, with normal or low-risk ASA class, uh, then they should be able to be comfortably sedated with fentanyl and Versed. Um, and then again, you want to ask the pa patients if they've had any prior history of uh, problems with anesthesia, such as with a prior EGD or colonoscopy, since they use similar medications for these procedures. So when you're setting up the room, this is your responsibility as a physician. So this is not your support staff. You need to make sure that all of these aspects are present. So is the oxygen on the patient, such as the nasal cannula or face mask, but then also make sure that the oxygen is actually on. I want to make sure that my vital signs are being taken every three minutes on the monitor. I want to make sure that reversal agents are in the room with Narcan and Flumazamil. I always keep a separate oxygen source handy in case the patient starts to breathe through the mouth and you have a nasal cannula in. You can deliver this separate oxygen cannula into the mouth next to the probe and often this is sufficient to bring up the oxygen levels. Uh, you want to make sure that suction is present and also on. It can be loud and annoying, uh, especially for older patients who have difficulty hearing. So I put this underneath the pillow to reduce uh, the noise associated with the suction. And then also I tend to position the patient on their left side so that if there's any vomiting or upper airway uh, uh, secretions that uh, those don't go down and cause aspiration. And this also allows me to have a more comfortable uh, procedure since I can rest the sonographer, I'm so, or sorry, rest the probe on the left side of the patient. And I have the machine set up across from me so that my sonographer can get the necessary images. If I'm doing the procedure myself, I'll do it uh, with the patient on the left side, but then the machine is on my side so that I can uh, adjust the knobs appropriately. So, for my cases, I numb up the back of the throat using viscous lidocaine and benzocaine. Uh, there is a very rare 1 in 10,000 chance of having methemoglobinemia, so you do need to make sure that you have methylene blue available uh, just in case. I've never had this occur before. I think that using the numbing agents in the back of the throat allows us to use less sedation. This is the biggest risk with the procedure, so the less sedation that I can use, I think it's a benefit to the patient. They also wake up easier. Uh, and there's less recovery time. I don't like using the bite block strap. I think this just adds another potential barrier for um, maintaining a stable airway. So if the patient's having trouble breathing or if they aspirate, I need to get my probe and my bite block out quickly. I'm not fiddling around with a, a strap that goes around the head. Um, I, I, I've never had an issue with patients biting through a probe or you know, spitting out the bite block. I just use my finger uh, my index finger on it and then uh, um, holding it in place. So for our younger patients, less than 60 years old, with no, comorbid, with no comorbid conditions, I usually start with 2 milligrams of Versed and 50 micrograms of fentanyl. You want to wait every 3 minutes before you give your next round of sedation. For younger patients with comorbid conditions, I use 2 and 25, and then for all my older patients, I start with 1 and 25, and I step up uh, appropriately. The average amount of sedation per case is usually 2 to 3 milligrams of Versed and 50 to 75 for older patients, and 4 to 5 milligrams of Versed and 75 to 100 milligrams for our younger patients. I never proceed past 8 milligrams of Versed and 200 micrograms of fentanyl. If I've given this much and the patient is not properly sedated, I, I just reschedule with anesthesia and they can give propofol. 
again, this is not an emergent procedure 99% of the time. You can afford to wait three minutes between each session to recheck the blood pressure. You never want to have to give reversal agents. So this is a mark of a good moderate sedation provider is never having to give reversal agents. So in general, Versed equals sleep, fentanyl equals gag and comfort. So if you've given your 2 and 50 for an older patient and they're asleep but you still have a strong gag reflex, you might want to give just a little bit more fentanyl and not more Versed. I tend to brush the patient's um, brow between their eyes or um, touch their eyelids and if uh, and say their name and if the patient doesn't wake up or open their eyes then we know that they're in proper moderate sedation. If the patient becomes hypoxic or hypotensive or needs increasing oxygen or IV fluids aren't helping then you stop the procedure. Again, you do not want to hurt the patient, do not try to force the procedure, take the probe out, stimulate the patient, potentially give reversal agents, give IV fluids, um, and but you, you want to use anesthesia at a later date and not to try to force the, the situation. And then if the patient has a history of bariatric surgery, recent stomach bleed, uh, again, you might want to forego the gastric views as mentioned in one of the previous talks. So be sure to, oh, lastly, uh, ICU patients are often the easiest since they already have sedation on board. Uh, you just want to make, consider removing the NG tube if you're having trouble uh, snaking the probe down. Oftentimes, you can get your finger pretty far back into the oral pharynx, and you can follow along uh, with the endotracheal tube. And uh, uh, oftentimes, you need some draw thrust as opposed to putting the chin to the chest. Uh, that we'll talk about more in our next talk regarding intubation tips. Thanks again, and be sure to check out uh, talk number five, that probably has the highest yield uh, revolving around getting good images.